I knew Yachiro Nambu during the decade of the 80s when I was a postdoc and a faculty member at Chicago. And he made an enormous impression on me during that time. I, I came to Chicago having worked at the interface of condensed matter physics and high energy physics and his work on using the ideas of superconductivity to explain the dynamics of the strong interactions was a, a paradigm of the efficacy of that approach and that gave a lot of us a lot of comfort about that. When my Chicago colleague Daniel Friedan taught me about string theory and the two of us started working together intensively on it, I learned a, about a whole other facet of Nambu's work and his central importance in that subject. And especially for me, the, the vivid nature of his intuitions, the idea of the world sheet and the Nambu Goto action really, well, really stayed with me to this day. He had a lot of other uh, important effects on my life. Uh, he was very supportive to Dan and I as young physicists just starting out. And well, as I look back and I look over the audience, I realize uh, that we were young then. And <laughs> his support was really important. He, uh, in his gentle way, he encouraged us to be bold and not to pay too much attention to received wisdom. And in an even more gentle and implicit way, he encouraged us not to be too beholden to senior physicists in the field. And, well, I think that was good advice in, in a number of ways. Uh, well, I think I have one more thing to say that let me... There's another quality about Nambu that's a little bit more difficult for me to explain, and that, that's why I needed to look at my notes. He, I, let me try to say it in, in a way that he had a sense of play about physics that I found very unusual. When he would encounter an idea, when he would find an idea or hear about an idea that pleased him, there, he took real pleasure in it. And this is a picture of Nambu that I particularly like. And, I guess I like to see that there's a subtle smile that he has, and, and that's a smile that I remember you know, to this day, the, the kind of smile he'd get when he'd learn something, whether it was about string theory or the way that ropes and pulleys work or, or just anything. And it, there was a sort of deep pleasure that he took in the ideas, and, and that's not common in my experience, and it's something I remember to this day. And it's clear to all of us that his passing is a big loss for, well, for Chicago and for physics as a whole. Well, the topic I want to talk about are, is the emergence of close connections between these two apparently different ideas of quantum chaos and quantum gravity. And this is a, yet another example of the kind of connections Nambu especially liked between two apparently disparate fields of science really coming together. But this topic is actually a Chicago story in another way. Uh, that, that I'll tell you a bit about. Uh, the last time I thought about chaos for any extended period of time was well, over 30 years ago when I was at Chicago and my brother Scott was a graduate student uh, with Leo Kadnoff and they were working on classical chaos at the time. The way simple systems as you changed the parameter would evolve from orderly behavior to chaotic behavior. And on occasion, I would listen to them uh, describe the work they were doing, and I would pick up a little bit about chaos by osmosis. And now, sort of more than 30 years ago, back in this room, well, it's not quite the same building, but back here, uh, I'm talking about chaos again. Okay. I wish Leo were still here so I could talk to him about these ideas. And it goes without saying that, that his passing is another big loss for Chicago and, well, for physics as a whole. Now let me turn to, to science. That chaos and, and quantum gravity are connected is, is not really a big surprise these days. Uh, probably goes back to the 1970s when we learned that black holes are actually thermal objects through the work of Bekenstein and Hawking. And in ordinary non-gravitational systems, it's been clear for a long time that thermal behavior is underlied by chaotic behavior. 
And so then the fact that uh, the thermal behavior of black holes might have something to do with chaos was, would not be implausible. And this plausibility turned into a certainty with the advent of the ADS-CFT correspondence, where certain large black holes in anti de Sitter space are precisely dual to the thermal behavior of certain ordinary non-gravitational systems, boundary gauge theories in particular. So this chaos in these ordinary non-gravitational systems must have some dual image in the gravitational description of these large black holes. Now, one hallmark of chaos is the relaxation to thermal equilibrium. You take a system that's thermally equilibrated and you ping it a little bit and you watch it relax back to the thermal equilibrium. It's typically decided by some relaxation time. And you can diagnose it by some time-ordered or retarded correlation function. Here's some two-point function, and it decays exponentially. Or here's another example where you take two Vs, apply them to the thermal state, wait a while, the, this perturbation settles down, you study two Ws, they seem, think that they're exactly in a thermal state again. So at long times, this goes over to the thermal expectation value of the Vs, times the thermal expectation values of the Ws, and it approaches this quantity exponentially with the ex relaxation time that I discussed here. Well, the gravitational dual of this relaxation has been known for some time through the work of Gary Horowitz and Veronica Hubini. And the gravitational analog are the quasi-normal modes of a black hole. If you ping a black hole a little bit, just its geometry, it rings a little bit and it rings down and settles back into its nice spherical configuration. These linearized modes have been studied for a long time, and these are the analog of this relaxation phenomenon. Now, I guess up till quite recently when I've talked about this subject, that was where I left it, because uh, this is a well-understood part of the theory of black, classical black holes. Well, things have improved a little bit, I guess, in the last month, because something like this relaxation has actually been observed experimentally. This is this famous signal that LIGO observed, I guess almost, a month, I guess almost exactly a month ago, uh, of the merger and the ring down of this famous black hole event in gravitational waves. Now, I'm told by the experts that this final region is dominated by noise, so I'm going to have to go back to the theoretical reconstruction of this event. This is the theoretical image of what the signal is. And you inspiral and you merge, and then this final period at the end here is the final settling down to the spherical geometry. And these are the quasi-normal modes, these tiny ripples that here are dominated by noise. But I think, well, I think it's fair to say that you can see this relaxation phenomenon in an experiment now. now. Of course, this is not an anti de Sitter space, this is in flat space, but the idea is very much the same. Well, these quasi-normal modes that uh, describe relaxation give a holographic description of transport coefficients if the operators that you perturb the system by correspond to conserved currents, like the stress tensor. And this was used to great effect by Palacastro, Son, and Steranets to calculate the viscosity in a system dual to a black hole in Einstein gravity. And they found this remarkable result that the ratio of the viscosity to the entropy density is given by 1 over 4 pi. In fact, this and other evidence led KSS to conjecture that this value was the smallest possible value that this ratio could attain in any physical system. You can turn viscosity, it's due to some scattering process, there's an essential scattering time. And when you back out the scattering time that this value uh, corresponds to, up to factors of 4 pi, it corresponds to the standard thermal quantum time h-bar over k Boltzmann times temperature, that Sachdev in particular, in his famous textbook even, has emphasized as this characteristic time that runs transport in strongly coupled quantum systems. Well, there's another hallmark of chaos that's especially known in the classical field, which is sensitive dependence on initial conditions, or more popularly known as the butterfly effect. <laughs> 
You know, the, the cartoon of this uh, last week, a butterfly's wings flap in Chicago, and yesterday there's torrential rain in Palo Alto. So, well, that was a good circumstance. I'm glad that happened. Uh, <laughs> the diagnostic, um, in classical terms, as you imagine, two trajectories in phase space, where the coordinates are slightly separated at time zero, and you monitor their, the magnitude of their separation at later time. And if you take this separation very small and the time large, in these kinds of strongly chaotic systems, you see an exponential separation of trajectories. And this exponential rate of increase is parametrized by a Lyapunov exponent. And the quantum analog of this phenomenon, let's call it the quantum butterfly effect, and its gauge gravity dual, will be the focus of this talk. And I'll be describing work I've done with Douglas Stanford and Juan Maldacena on this subject. Well, the origin of the line of development that I'm going to describe is interesting, and I think Nambu would have appreciated it. It comes from what seems to be a quite a different part of the ideas in physics. It comes from the uh, field of quantum information. And it comes out of a quite a different superficial problem, the problem of building a quantum circuit or a quantum computational algorithm that can rapidly produce a good approximation to a random unitary operator, let's say on a system of n qubits. Now a random unitary operator is the ultimate in quantum chaos. So being able to produce it has something to do with quantum chaos. In fact, these authors and, and others showed that there was an algorithm that could do this in log n time, if you have n qubits, and you might think of that as log of the entropy of the system. That's very fast. And Hayden and Preskill took the important step of connecting this to the physics of black holes, and Sakino and Susskind further developed it by connecting it to gauge gravity duality. Now, our job was to give a precise description of these phenomena. And to do that, we needed a diagnostic of quantum chaos, in particular, this butterfly effect. So the first thing you might think about, it's the first thing everybody thinks about, is you just mimic the classical definition. You take two quantum states that are close by in Hilbert space norm and ask how that distance changes as you evolve them. But, uh, well, it's a deep fact that unitary uh, in quantum mechanics, states evolve by unitarily, and a unitary operator does not change the distance between vectors in Hilbert space. Yes? Yeah, good. That's, that's correct, rather than the distance of points. Yeah, that's right. So we need something like the, dis the, the analog of the distance of points. Well, in fact, although we didn't know it at the time, the, the correct answer to this was derived uh, semi-classically by Larkin and Ovchinnikov in the 1960s. And they said, well, look, classically you want to compute this property, the, the change in a, the position of something at time t with the position of something at time zero, and you can write this as the Poisson bracket of a coordinate at time t with a momentum at time zero. But then you can follow semi-classical quantization and write this as 1 over ih bar times the commutator of these two operators. So this commutator contains the information that you're looking for. And if you're interested kind of in the size of a commutator as an operator, you could, to avoid plus and minus signs, you could square it, put a minus sign to get rid of the i, and then let's say take its thermal expectation value to measure kind of the, the size of these operators in typical states. And so, in fact, this is a diagnostic that you would expect to grow as this derivative grows. And so this is the kind of diagnostic that we're going to work with. Now, it's useful to think about this diagnostic not using semi-classical intuition, but directly uh, in quantum mechanics, let's say in a qubit system. You have an operator that evolves in time, which just writing out what that means is a, evolution forward in time, applying an operator, let's say it's a rather simple operator like one Pauli matrix, and then evolving backwards. If there was no operator here, you'd have an exact cancellation between forward and backward time evolution. If the system was 
simple, let's say, a free field theory, all you do when you evolve forward and then backwards with some field operator is the field operator might move. Nothing very interesting. But suppose you have a complicated, chaotic Hamiltonian. Then the small perturbation could dramatically disrupt the cancellation between forward and backward. And the operator that you get, especially if you evolve for large time, could be very complicated. It could be, let's say, sums of large products of Pauli matrices. So it's kind of a mess. And then you could diagnose this mess by taking the commutator of this messy thing with a given Pauli matrix, say. And this commutator would build up as more and more Pauli matrices are created. And so this is, again, the same signature. But we expect it to apply more generally, not just in some semi-classical context. Now, <laughs> a commutator squared has four terms. I think all of us can agree on that. Two of the terms will turn out to be time-ordered, in a sense I'll talk about in a minute. They won't do anything interesting in time, as we described. Time-ordered things tend to saturate at least time. But there's two terms that have a more interesting order. For instance, there's a term that goes like v at time zero, w at time t, v at time zero, w at time t. They're out of time order. Such a thing will have substantial time dependence. In fact, it will decrease with time, and that decrease is what causes this commutator to increase. And this will be the diagnostic that we'll use, this out-of-time-order correlator, to examine how chaotic our systems are. Well, it's yet useful to think about this in, in, a, a, well, in, a, in a similar but uh, pictorially different way. Let's imagine this out-of-time order correlator written as a thermal trace. Rho is the thermal density matrix, and let's try to make a picture of it. Well, a thermal trace is going around in Euclidean time, around a circle. So here's the circle corresponding to the thermal trace. But here we've applied the operator V, and then we've applied W in real time. The fact that it's sticking out of the circle means that's real Minkowski time. Then it comes back, and you apply V at time zero. Then you come back out, and then you join the thermal trace. These things are called time folds. And these red Vs interposed between the uh, spikes means that these time folds can't cancel. If there was, well, and so it's this lack of cancellation that's characteristic of a good diagnostic of chaos. Some of the other terms in the commutator, here's another one. This is V, W, W, V, would correspond to moving this red V over here. Then these two Ws uh, would be close to each other in time. Part of their operator product, let's say, would contain the identity. And then you would just be going forward and back, and you would have cancellation of the time fold. And so that would explain why this ordering would saturate at late time. So it's these Lack of cancellations of the time folds that is the pictorial thing to look for, for an operator that will be sensitive to chaos. Well, so we have a mathematically well-posed thing that we think will diagnose chaos. We actually can see whether it's operational in the sense, can we measure it? And the answer is yes, but with difficulty. And to understand that, let's imagine what it means to actually compute this thing or to measure it. You apply V to your thermal state, that's easy. You evolve forward time T and apply W, that you can imagine doing in a lab, no problem. But then you have to run backward in time and apply V. Running backward in time is significantly more challenging. Okay? And then forward again to apply W. But there's a substitute for running backwards in time that's quite useful, and that is changing the sign of the Hamiltonian. Running forward in time with negative Hamiltonian is the moral equivalent of running backward in time. And this is an idea with a long history. The first version that we know about is something called the spin echo, where you imagine a spin in a magnetic field. It evolves forward in time, rotating around. And then you reverse the sign of the magnetic field. That changes the sign of the Hamiltonian and let the thing evolve further in time. But it's really tracing its course backward in time. 
and hopefully, if the system is noise-free, you'll come back to exactly where you started. But you could imagine running something like an echo experiment, running forward, perturbing the system a little bit, and then running backwards, and see how badly you mismatch when you come back. That's essentially what this diagnostic is telling you about. So what we're interested in is some many-body version of a spin echo in, in the field that's sometimes called a Loschmidt echo. It's been worked on a lot by a group led by Pastowski. Yes? Um, you mean whether, well, you can, for instance, suppose the magnetic field, you have H times the spin of the magnet, magnetic field times a uh, Pauli matrix. You can clearly try to change the sign of the magnetic field. You want H to be bounded in some sense. So you want a system that's bounded. No, you need to change everything. You need to change everything. But you want a system that's essentially bounded, so changing H makes sense. Like, like built out of fermions or something. So, in fact, uh, my colleagues at Stanford actually have been thinking, they have proposed an experiment using cold atom magic in cavity QED, where you, by delicately detuning lasers off resonance, you can actually change the sign of the effective interactions. And in principle, at least, build an experiment like this, where you can take a strongly interacting system and run it forward and backward in time and see how much of a mismatch you get when you perturb the system a little bit. So this thing is, it's difficult to measure, far more difficult than measuring relaxation. But it's not impossible, and it may be that interesting things can be learned. Well, let's now turn to, to studying it the way Douglas and I started when thinking about trying to do holographic calculations of these out-of-time order correlators and closely related quantities. This was done independently by Katea. So here's a, a general correlator, and we can imagine these times to be general and think of them as being out of time order. And one way of seeing what's going on is to imagine writing this thermal expectation value as an actual inner product of states. And you can do that by introducing the state called the thermal field double, made of two copies of the system. This goes back to Keldish Schwinger ideas. And then apply, to make the state psi prime, apply W4 and V3, and then apply W2 and V1 to this, where again, this TFD is the thermal field double state, which I'll remind people that don't know about it. It's this entangled state of two copies of your system, a left system and a right system, weighted this way. And the state has the property that if you study operators just in the right system, trace out over the left, the entanglement produces a thermal density matrix in the right system. The holographic dual of this is known by the work of Juan to be the eternal ADS Schwarzschild black hole. This boundary is where the right conformal field theory lives, this is the left conformal field theory, and this is the wormhole linking the two regions. Let me just say for future reference, the boundary time is like Schwarzschild time, and a shift in boundary time corresponds to a boost in the global system. If you like, focus on this little Minkowski-like region. Moving in time is like a Lorentz boost, and T is the rapidity of that boost. You can think of it also as the boost in Rindler space near the horizon. So now let's talk about what a holographic calculation of this out-of-time order thing would look like. Let's try to construct psi prime, which is W then V applied. So the first thing we'll do is apply W on the thermal field double late. T4 is late. That makes in the bulk some pulse, let's say, of thermal energy, the black hole thermal energy. And then this is a picture of the state which you can look at at any time. So let's look at it earlier in time. Here's a convenient bulk time slice. We'll move it back to this earlier slice, indexed by an early boundary time. The pulse evolves backward using global gravitational evolution. It'll be very close to the horizon down here. So this is the picture of the state at time t3. Well, now you can try to apply v at t3 
by hitting V at this point. So now we've hit this state with V at T3, creating this red pulse. And the combined state, V after W, looks like a pulse here on this left horizon and a pulse here near the right horizon. And then you could imagine the time evolution of this, and I'll let you guess what might happen if you let these two pulses evolve. Well, they're going to collide very near the central point where the horizons cross. We now can build psi itself, which is W2 after V of T1. Here's the pictures I had before building psi prime. We now can build this state by first applying V at T1, letting it evolve late. This pulse is near the horizon up here. And then applying W at T2 here. So this is, if you will, if we think about global time, not boundary time, but just time in crustal coordinates, if you will, this looks like a set of pulses early in that global time, and this looks like a set of pulses late. And what intervenes if you evolve this in time is some kind of collision. We can think about this as some kind of in-state, which evolves, collides, and has inner product with an out state. So in fact, this out of time order correlator, which is the overlap of this state with this state, is an in-out matrix element. That is an S matrix element, thought of as a global time ordered scattering process. This funny out of time order thing you do in boundary time translates to a natural global time ordered collision. That's part of the reason it's useful for thinking about black hole physics. Well, how big will it be? Well, we need to know something about the S matrix between those two pulses in the bulk of ADS Schwarzschild. We'll be interested, for reasons you'll see in a minute, for the kind of collision that grows fastest with energy. And that kind of interaction is the exchange of gravitons. We know perturbatively, if the scattering is not too strong, that gravitational exchange between these two pulses, no matter what the pulses are made out of, goes like G Newton times Mandelstam S, where Mandelstam S is the center of mass energy squared. How big is Mandelstam S? Well, here we use the fact that translations of the boundary time correspond to global boosts, and little t plays the role of rapidity. So energy grows exponentially in a little time. So the center of mass energy squared is like some characteristic energy, like the temperature of the Hawking radiation squared, times exponential in time, and this is the correct factor, where beta is the inverse temperature of the black hole. In ADS CFT, let's say for a large N super Yang Mills theory, G Newton goes like 1 over N squared. So this phase shift goes like 1 over N squared e to the 2 pi t over beta. And so this out of time order correlator will look like the no scattering piece minus the first correction, G Newton s, which is some coefficient I won't be careful about. 1 over n squared exponential of 2 pi time over beta. So chaos develops in this way. So we've given a holographic calculation using classical gravitational scattering of the way this out of time order beha uh, correlator behaves. Notice that the strength of this exponential, of this, uh, exponential scattering is independent of the detailed nature of V and W. They make scalar fields or a massive scalar field or a light scalar field, it doesn't matter because the interaction of gravity is universal. These coefficients can change, but this exponential behavior in the 1 over n squared cannot. So the slogan to take away is that the onset of chaos is gauge gravity dual to a high energy gravitational collision near the black hole horizon. And it's a classical collision at large M. Because these collisions occur so close to the horizon, this is a very sharp diagnostic of horizon physics. And in fact, this exponential behavior is a precise diagnostic of the Rindler character of the horizon. 
We just talked about one graviton exchange. You can sum over the ladders of repeated graviton exchange. And this, in the standard way, is an iconal resummation, which, as a Tuft first showed, is equivalent to doing high energy scattering off of, scattering off of a gravitational shock wave corresponding to the highly boosted gravitational field of one of the pulses. And this is the geometry of a black hole with a gravitational shock wave running along one of the horizons. Okay. And it took some time ago, maybe 20 years ago, thought about uh, such shock waves in the context of doing high energy scattering in black holes. Well, let's look back at this uh, lowest order result. This exponential growth, uh, Kateyev taught us that you should actually think of this as an analog of Lyapunov exponential growth. And you can then identify the analog of a Lyapunov exponent here as 2 pi over beta, which is the same as 2 pi times temperature. A Lyapunov exponent is an inverse time. And the time is 1 over this strong coupling time that we talked about earlier. It's h bar over kt inverse. So up to these two pi's, again, we have seen this characteristic time that seems to run strongly coupled systems. Well, here's a kind of a cartoon of what a correlator like d would look like as a function of time. We've been talking about the very early time when there's hardly any deviation from the initial constant. An appreciable break occurs when this exponential starts becoming comparable to the 1 over n squared suppressing, suppressing it. And this time would be then roughly beta over 2 pi log n squared, where this coefficient and this log n squared are precise. And we can write that as beta over 2 pi log of the entropy. So we've now seen this log of entropy time emerging from this calculation with a precise coefficient. And the fast scrambling conjecture that Sakino and Susskind made is that this logarithmic growth is the fastest possible for any reasonable physical system. Well, this raises a puzzle um, that Douglas and I spent a long time thinking about. If the center of mass energy squared goes like temperature squared exponential in time, as you increase time, this energy becomes enormous. For instance, at two scrambling times, the energy squared goes like n to the fourth. That means the energy goes like n squared. That's enough energy to make a macroscopic black hole. Is it really true when you're studying the development of chaos, you have to think about the production of macroscopic black holes in the center of ADS? No. The answer is no, but um, it took us a long time to figure that out. Uh, it turns out you need to think about it a little more carefully. If you write this out of time order correlator, thought of more carefully, a range of bulk momenta are produced by V and W, and the range is determined by boundary to bulk propagators that tell you the amplitude for having each different kind of mode in the bulk. And then D is actually given by the integral of this S matrix element at different momenta weighted by the boundary to bulk propagators. And it turns out that this thing is dominated by momentum for which G Newton times Mandelstam S is order one. This is the, the value for which the scrambling time occurs. Very large S causes a strongly inelastic collision. Making a macroscopic black hole is strongly inelastic, take my word for it. Okay. Which gives a small value of in without. The designated out state has hardly any connection to the in-state if you make a macroscopic black hole, which makes a small contribution to this correlator. So in some sense, the late time behavior of D is determined by the amplitude for a very high energy collision, an inelastic collision, not to happen. If it happens, the in-out is zero, so it makes no contribution. You want the amplitude for that not to happen. And it turns out at late time, that's determined by the tails of the boundary to bulk propagators that give you a small amplitude for not very high energies to happen. Now, the tails of these boundary to bulk propagators are not universal. They depend on V and W. And in fact, they're determined by quasi-normal modes. 
And so here, the first break here is universal. It's just determined by the gravitational scattering. The late time tail here, the shape of that, is determined by the tails of this wave function and the quasi-normal modes of V and W. Now, although in this simplest process, these inelastic processes make essentially no contribution, it's possible to, to study other quantities and a more refined information, for instance, the phase of D, that has some information about these inelastic processes, which are quite interesting, especially from the bulk point of view. And this is an area of the subject that hasn't been studied very carefully, and I think it would be a good thing to, to think about if, if people are, are looking for, for things to, to study. Well, one other kind of thing you can learn from this sort of calculation is the way chaos propagates in space. So far, I've assumed that these operators are, let's say, smeared in space. But you can imagine that they are localized. So V is at point zero, and W is at point X in transverse space. And so this will give you bulk scattering at various impact parameters that are related to this separation in transverse space. And you study this essentially by computing the localized shock wave profile in the bulk, the shock wave source by a localized uh, perturbation. You're then interested in the phase shift, not just a function of Mandelstam S, but also as a function of impact parameter. And standard gravitational scattering in anti de Sitter Schwarzschild geometries gives a formula like this. A power law would be what you'd expect for gravitational scattering in flat space in high enough dimension. But in ADS space, you have an exponential decrease because of the curvature of the anti de Sitter space, where this exponential decrease goes like 1 over beta. So dropping these power laws, which are subleading, this out-of-time order correlator looks schematically like the constant piece times something growing in time that we've discussed times something decaying in space. So you can ask at what time does the growing part in time overwhelm the decaying part in space? You get that by setting these two equal, and you find it happens when x is equal to some velocity times time. And this is the effective velocity at which an appreciable amount of chaos spreads out. Putting in the actual numbers here, you find this velocity goes like this thing, where d is the space-time dimension of the boundary field theory. And we call this the butterfly velocity. It's the rate at which this butterfly effect propagates out. Except in dimension equals 2, um, the velocity is slower than the speed of light. It's very good, it's not faster, but it actually turns out to be slower. And it turns out it actually corresponds to one of the results by which entanglement spreads, a result from by which entanglement saturation spreads that Hong Liu and, and Josephine Su study. Well, it turns out this is the energy that's important in these processes. It's a high energy. It turns out it's a high enough energy that stringy corrections are important. And so, in fact, you can try to compute stringy corrections to what I've said before, following this beautiful paper by Brower, Polchinski, Strassler, and Tan. And roughly speaking, you replace uh, this Einstein gravity scattering with a string S matrix. Well, let's orient ourselves by doing it in uh, flat space in the Reggie limit, which is the appropriate kinematics for this process. So you replace S, Mandelstam S, by S to the 1 plus alpha prime T, where this T is now Mandelstam T. This is a famous formula that Nambu knew very well. And Mandelstam T in these kinematics is minus transverse momentum squared. So you find that scattering grows like S to the first minus something that depends on transverse momentum. The effect of this, it's known very well in string theory, is that the effective size of one string scattering off of another grows logarithmically, the square root of the logarithm of center of mass energy. This is this growing disk that many of you have heard about when you hear about string theory. Now, because S is exponential in time, this means that the size of this disk goes like the square root of time. Now, things that grow like the square root of time are not ballistic propagation. They're diffusional. And in fact, 
This formula shows that there's a kind of, not just a ballistic propagation of chaos, but a diffusion of chaos as well. And so there's an interplay between this butterfly velocity ballistic propagation coupled with a slower diffusion that rounds out the sharp edges. Now, working in, in curve space, ADS Schwarzschild, you find you replace S by S to the 1 minus 1 over the square root of the Atuf coupling, C1 that doesn't depend on transverse momenta plus something that depends on transverse momenta, where again, 1 over the Atuf coupling is related to the string scale over the ADS scale. Remember, S is exponential in time, so each transverse momentum has a separate Lyapunov exponent. This is lambda sub L is Lyapunov, lambda without a subscript is the Atuf coupling. So you find a whole spectrum of Lyapunov exponents, and this diffusional spread is related to this combined action of a whole bunch of different Lyapunov exponents beating against each other. The fastest one corresponds to zero transverse momentum, a completely spread out signal, and that Lyapunov exponent is the Einstein gravity value minus a small correction when the Atuf coupling is large. Stringy effects slow down the growth of chaos. This is a special case of a quite general result that Kamanjo, Edelstein, Maldacena, and Zhiboidov found. In general, for perturbative scattering, the scattering can grow no faster than Mandelstam S. And this is a very general argument that's based on unitarity, causality, and analyticity alone. No string theory injected. Well, this scattering bound and the stringy result I discussed suggest that there should be a universal bound on Lyapunov behavior because that's related to the rate of growth of scattering strength. In fact, it suggests that lambda sub L should be less than or equal to the Einstein gravity value. That corresponds to s to the first power. Now, such a conjecture is in the spirit of this famous KSS, eta over entropy density conjecture. It says, this says that scattering can be no faster than a certain amount, the one that happens in Einstein gravity. This says that the time scale, of course, of Lyapunov behavior can be no faster than the time scale found in Einstein black holes. And this is a numerically precise refinement of the fast scrambling conjecture that thing, says things can no, grow no faster than exponentially. Here, this is a bound on the coefficient of the exponential growth. So in fact, Juan, myself, and Douglas Stanford were able to give a sharp argument based on plausible physical assumptions establishing this bound. And so I'll spend a few minutes giving you an outline of this argument. We assume that the systems have a large number of degrees of freedom, I'll call n squared, thinking about large n gauge theories. And the bound is accurate to the order of that large number of degrees of freedom. And second, uh, intuitively stated that there's a large hierarchy between uh, the relaxation time scale and the scrambling time. That is that the curves I've showed you are very flat before they break. This is to rule out certain extreme systems where you could just imagine a completely random Hamiltonian that in one time step completely mixes up everything in the system. A canonical example of this is a large N gauge theory where V and W are single trace operators. And I'll phrase the rest of the argument in this language. Well, a crucial thing is to introduce a diagnostic of chaos that's easy to handle. And the right one is something we call f of t. It's a variant of this out of time order correlator that also diagnoses chaos. This is easy to visualize on one of these thermal circles. Instead of having everything over here, we have vw, vw, spread them out uniformly on the circle, spaced by 90 degrees. Written out in symbols is like this, where y is the fourth root of the thermal density matrix. This is a nice symmetrical configuration that has lots of good properties. And I'll start enumerating them. This is what it behaves like. At early times, we can use large n factorization on this quantity and just break it into sets of two and argue that it's given by this quantity, 
VV spaced by 180 degrees times WW spaced by 180 degrees. And the pesky VW contraction I'll assume is zero. For ease, I'll assume that V and W have different global symmetries. So here's some more good properties of F. F of t in complex time is real on the real time axis. Here's the complex time plane. I've lied to you a little bit that d, this out of time order correlator, I've talked about it as something with a size. It's actually complex, okay? And some of those curves you should think about as curves as for the magnitude of d. This quantity is real for real time, mixing it making it easier to argue about its size. Second, F is analytic in this half strip. Because things are separated by 90 degrees, it's clear rotating in imaginary time by less than 90 degrees, there's no operator collisions, nothing bad can happen. So this corresponds to rotating by 90 degrees. Nothing can happen. It could very well be that things are analytic past this, but at least things are analytic in this strip. We then have the power of analytic functions to, to help us. Well, here we get to some of the more important properties. Along this line, we expect by chaos that F decreases. We assert that, in fact, this decrease property, that F is less than or equal to its starting value is true even when you have some imaginary time, when you come along here or here. And this is where, this is the, the heart of the argument. We want to argue this is the case and we use, we want to argue about something being bounded in the whole strip. We use the maximum modulus principle. So we need to bound this thing on the edges of this strip. Well, at this early time vertical boundary, we can use large n factorization to show this is true up to order one over n squared. At early time, nothing much can happen, and so this must be true. This is where these systems that correspond to random Hamiltonians could get you in trouble. On the horizontal boundaries, you could say just use large n factorization again, but here is the rub there. Times could be very large. And we saw you could get things that go like 1 over n squared exponential in time. And you could have a non-uniformity where even though things were down by 1 over n squared, t could be so big that the correction would be large. So in fact, on these horizontal boundaries, this quantity f is set up that you can use a Cauchy-Schwarz inequality on it to bound f by a time-ordered correlator. As we talked about in the beginning, time-ordered correlators we expect should saturate at late time. They shouldn't do anything unpleasant at late time. And so large n factorization should be uniformly accurate all along these intervals. Here, this is a, a very plausible physical assumption, but it, in this case at least it's not mathematically established. So accepting this physical assumption, we have this property that f over fd is less than or equal to 1 plus this error we're using to control things. So we have this in the whole strip. And such an analytic function obeys the chaos bound. In general, this follows from a function in complex a theorem in complex analysis called the Schwartz-Pick theorem. I won't go through this. Instead, I'll, give, I'll argue by example. Here's an example of what we might expect this function to do. Starts off at 1 and then exponentially decays. Sorry, it decreases by an exponentially growing amount. And we'll call that exponential factor a Lyapunov exponent. Now suppose this lambda sub L was very big, 100 times the chaos bound. What goes wrong? Well, Analytic functions that decrease rapidly in real time wiggle very rapidly in imaginary time. This is just the way analytic functions work. And if it wiggles very rapidly in imaginary time, you can change that minus sign to a plus sign within the strip. If it's 100 times, you only have to go up to 1 one hundredth the width of, width of the strip to change that minus sign to a plus sign. Then as you evolved in real time, things would not decrease, they would increase, violating 
this property. So analyticity prevents you from decaying too fast because then you'd wiggle too fast. And in fact, the width of the strip just correspond to saying that this exponent has to be less than or equal to 2 pi over beta, the chaos bound. So we're in this happy situation of having a sharp bound on the behavior of thermal quantum systems motivated by holography, in particular what happens in Einstein gravity, that we can firmly establish by general arguments in the boundary theory, making no reference to gravity, just using things like unitarity, analyticity, and so on. Well, I'm actually about done. There are a lot of directions this, these uh, ideas can be taken in. And let me just close by, by mentioning one that's very interesting. You could ask the question, what systems saturate the chaos bound? Well, there's already been an answer. Systems that are dual to Einstein gravity, very strongly coupled super yang mills theory. That's, okay, that's an interesting system. But are there more uh, systems that, that don't have these kind of gauge theory duals that also saturate the bound? And in a remarkable uh, development, Kitaev showed that a variant of a very simple model due to Sachdev and Ye that introduced, I think, over 20 years ago, has this property. And the variant that Kitaev studied is this quantum mechanics model built out of n fermions. Each of the chi sub i is a fermion field. And you sum them in all possible groups of four weighted by a random coupling. Okay? And this random coupling is drawn, has mean zero and variance, we'll call the variance, well, the standard deviation J bar. And this Hamiltonian, can be solved when n goes to infinity by using souped up vector-like large n techniques. The diagrams are nowhere near as hard as the planar diagrams that we've thrown up our hands to sum, but are enough more complicated than the standard vector-like bubbles that yield models that are almost integral. It's really a kind of Goldilocks model. You know, hard enough, easy enough to solve, but hard enough to do something interesting. In particular, it's maximally chaotic when J bar is very large, the dimensionless thing is J bar compared to temperature, when that ratio goes to infinity. So N goes to infinity, this ratio going to infinity, chaos denounced, uh, diagnosed by computing an out of time order correlator goes to infinity. This is a hint that this model might provide an example of a solvable model of holography. It seems to have something like a Rindler horizon in it. And this would fulfill, actually, a proposal that Subir made, what was it, eight years ago? That this model, based on the properties of the two-point function, might be a model of holography in one time direction. The bulk would be one space in one time, ADS2 CFT1. And this model is under intensive investigation. Polchinski and Rosenhaus wrote a paper. Maldacena and Douglas Stanford are working on this intensively. And I think Juan, in his talk this afternoon, will tell us more about this model. So rather than go on further, let me just return to what brings us all here today. Let's see, Ichiro Nambu. Well, I, I hope he would have enjoyed seeing this connection between apparently disparate areas of physics. But enjoy it or not, I'm quite confident that he would not have been surprised to see that new connections like this continue to be uncovered. So I'll stop there. Thank you. Questions? Your description of the ballistic propagation of chaos reminds me a little of the Lee Robinson bound. I, I didn't hear the last thing you your said. Your description yes. of the ballistic propagation of chaos reminds me a little of the Lee Robinson bound. Yes, it's, it's very, it, it, it seems like it's a very uh, close analog of that, where you don't examine operator norms, but thermal expectation values as a, as a proxy for deciding how big a commutator squared is. But it has very much of that flavor. It's exactly, it's, a, it's an analog of a Lee-Robinson velocity. The yes. 
you seem to stop at leading order terms, regardless of how big that is. So what kind of role would the higher order terms will play? In, in, in 1 over m squared? That's one thing. The other, there was another one, this, uh, when you calculate d, is the c0 minus, that's exponential. Yes, so, so oh, good. A certain subset of those diagrams can be summed. This is this iconal resummation. Okay, and this produces the scattering off of a shock wave and gives you, oh here, I'll do the terrible thing of going backwards. Uh, so if you do an iconal resummation, that is you sum all the latter diagrams corresponding to multiple graviton exchanges. In some sense, you might think these are the leading terms at large G Newton S. It corresponds, as iconal resummations often do, to scattering off of a classical field distribution. Here it's a classical gravitational field that looks like a, a gravitational shock wave. And that problem produces a figure that looks like this. The, the first order thing corresponds to the first deviation from this constant line. The full resummation gives you a curve like this. Okay. There are other uh, higher order terms that are more difficult uh, to deal with. We only have partial understanding of those. Okay. In particular, things corresponding to inelastic processes. But this seems like a, a, a resummation of, of what very well be, might be the leading set of diagrams at high energy. Um, I didn't uh, understand very well the uh, the requirements on the, the you, you made a requirements that the Hamiltonian not be too pathological that yes. it somehow didn't have chaos built in. I wonder if you could I I explain that a little bit more and maybe in re especially in reference to the I guess it's the SYK model at the end which yes. did have this some randomness or in it. Could you ex could you just explain that a little bit more? Well. Uh, um, yeah, the kind of randomness I was talking about that could be a problem was much worse than the SYK model. It would be that every element in the Hamiltonian matrix in Fox space could be a random element. So, you know, let's say in an SYK model, the dimension of the Hilbert space might be 2 to the n. Okay? So you have a 2 to the n by 2 to the n matrix describing the Hamiltonian. A really random Hamiltonian, in the sense I was using, would have 2 to the n random numbers in it. SYK is only n to the fourth random numbers, okay? So it's a correlated matrix. And in fact, this kind of system, the, another way of stating the requirement uh, in the language that uh, Hayden and Preskill and Sakino Suskan use is you want the system to be k-local. Even though you can have things that are rather non-local, you have only a fixed k number of degrees of freedom coupled at a time, even as n goes to infinity. Okay. This is enough to argue, uh, at least plausibly, that the early time vertical segment of that diagram, that even as you go up in imaginary time, that it's, it, stay, it, it obeys this bound. If you had a completely random Hamiltonian, it could be that uh, that function would be up and down, not satisfying a, a good bound. So that's the kind of property you're looking for. You mentioned this uh, tsunami velocity. Of yes. It's not the tsunami velocity, it's another velocity. It's, it's not a, exactly that velocity. There are two velocities that they discuss. And the, there's a, a velocity corresponding to the final settling down to the completely entangled situation. It's that settling down saturation velocity that turns out to be the same as this. I see, and that's a general feature of all holographic models, that velocity it has exactly that value. I believe if it's described by the Cubini, Rangamani, Tajikawa surface, the answer is yes. Is that correct? <laughs> Takinagi. <laughs> right. Sorry, yes. I got the first two names right, and they're in the audience. So, <laughs> uh, that, <laughs> that was important. Is there a bound on this velocity? I'm sorry? Is there a bound on the butterfly velocity? On the butterfly velocity. Um, I, I'm misremembering. I think, I mean, the obvious way to look for this is to add a gauss binet term. And my, my recollection, maybe one, do you remember, is that this, this, that actually can move. Is that, do you remember? Yeah, I, I think there's not. In, well, <laughs> I think the gauss binet term, an important test, as you know, about whether bounds exist, 
is to add a Gauss-Binet term and to see whether things get pushed up or down. Uh, it was an important piece of data that the uh, Lyapunov exponent was not sensitive to this, roughly because the scattering is just corresponds to the spin of the graviton. I think the, the butterfly velocity moves up or down. That's described in a paper by Roberts, Stanford, and Susskind. So the result exists, but, and, but I, th I think I'm quoting it correctly, but we should check. Uh, the, the first definition of the Lyapunov exponent that you gave on second or third uh, slide was a, a divergence of classical trajectories yes. on phase space. Yes. And there's no temperature there. Yes. And then all of a sudden, or not all of a sudden, but yes. 10 or 20 slides later, there's a bound that it involves a temperature. Right. So uh, how are we supposed to think of that? Is it something to about... Are we supposed to think that temperature is an energy of the configurations? That it, how, how does this bound, temperature-dependent bound, what, does it say anything about the, the exponents on classical phase space? Well, well, for instance, I mean, yes, I think you, you, you said partially what I might answer. Suppose, the, think in a classical gas where you're talking about a collision time, okay? Well, the collision time might depend on the velocity of the atoms. And as you go to higher and higher energy or temperature, the velocity would get faster, and the Lyapunov time would get uh, shorter. So, that's a, so, so the Lyapunov time could easily depend on the energy of your energy surface. And that would be a, a related phenomenon. In quantum field theory, it's, it's, it's even more... Um, well, there's, there's another factor, which is the number of quanta you have to scatter off or, off of increases as you increase the energy or temperature of the system. So you have more, quote unquote, atoms to scatter off of, as well as each one containing more energy. Their, their, their velocity is saturated because it approaches the velocity of light, but their, the gas of uh, quanta is denser, and so the scattering time can get quicker. You might ask, is there a, a dimension, a temperature independent notion? And you might just ask, what is the size of the commutator squared as an operator? Okay, but in quantum field theory, those operators are kind of infinite size. You have to decide a notion of how big, how you define the size of an operator. So there has to be some kind of cutoff procedure, and a thermal trace is an example of one. But, it's, but it is true that as you go up to higher energies, you expect Lyapunov times to get shorter. Uh, I, could you say again how string theory came into this? <laughs> there was GNS, that looked like the Planck length, and then, and then there was, how did the string, why is the string length well, relevant to the discussion? As you and I both remember, um, string theory contains gravity, and I could have written GNS as G string squared times S times L string squared, let's say in four dimensions, okay? So GNS was just a code for a little piece of the string scattering, okay? So, um, so in that first line, I would have said Planck scale effects are important here. Are they? It turns out that's actually not that's not the case. The energy here, because S is energy squared, it turns out that this corresponds to an. Uh, a center of mass energy that's like, uh, um, well, it's Planckian energy, but at that energy, it turns out the tree-level string theory is still accurate if the, if, the, if the impact parameter is ADS scale. So this is a region where um, tree-level string theory is still accurate. Okay. You mentioned that this relaxation time to equilibrium for black holes was reflected in the, the ring down of the black hole merger, yes. the gravity waves. I was yes. wondering if you can kind of make any stronger statements connecting this bound on scrambling time to the actual experimental ring down time. Yeah, okay, so you're asking whether or not there is a bound on these quasi-normal mode times. Yeah, if there's any relationship. And, and I think the answer to that is uh, we don't know, and there's a lot of evidence that you can build um, 
quasi-normal load times that are very fast. If you consider, let's say, a very heavy bulk field in ADS, it rings down extraordinarily fast. It's ring down time, it's proportional to the mass when the mass is heavy. And so a very heavy field um, actually gets sucked into the black hole very quickly. And so there's not going to be any simple bound. For masses of order ADS, the characteristic scale is given by this strong coupling time. But you can build situations where there's an arbitrarily large integer in front of it, or not integer, but an arbitrarily large constant in front of it. I, I'm, I'm actually interested in what the analog is, is on the field theory side of that. And I think the answer is that operators that correspond to these very heavy bulk fields are highly composite operators. They're built of many quanta. And so it's very easy to degrade those uh, composite operators, because you can scatter off of any one of the uh, constituent quanta. And that causes a, a rather large uh, anomalous dimension, which is related to the uh, quasi-normal mode time. So I, I, I don't know of a simple bound like that. Now, it's very interesting to think of bounds like that, because it's related to the viscosity bound, which is related to some kind of quasi-normal mode time for, for the current operators. That, so that's a really interesting thing to think about. <laughs>